All right, well, good, good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. Um, before I forget, I want to say that I, I'm going to be doing a, a meditation psychology program in two weeks at Chimbala, and, um, and also another one, one on yoga a month later with a neuroscientist, uh, neuropsychologist, sorry. And um, <clears throat> she's, uh, she's been a great influence on me, really beginning to look at the actual physical components of meditation in the brain. So this real stuff that's happening. It's something that separates, particularly the traditions that, that I'm from. The Shambhala tradition is a Western orientation, but its home base is in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, particularly the Nyingma and Kagyu schools of Tibetan Buddhism. So um, what that means are the more meditation-oriented schools. The Dalai Lama is uh, from the Galuk school, which is a more academic school and political, obviously, and, and they run the country um, on a political level. Tibet now, since the diaspora, is sort of all the, the schools are coming together, but the particular orientation that my school comes from is a kind of metaphor first tradition, if you will. So they start to think about the idea that the philosophy behind meditation, the academic sort of um, outcroppings, if you will, or support of meditation, as well as the religious aspects, are less to the point than the actual physical component, the practical component of actually <coughs> sitting. So it's kind of interesting, and I don't know how people feel about religions or Buddhism or that kind of thing. But even the Dalai Lama has said that Buddhism, he doesn't consider it a religion as such, but more of a science of the mind. And when asked about what his religion was then, he said, my religion is loving kindness. So it, there's this idea that the orientation is very practical. It's based on what we actually do. And to meditate from the point of view of uh, wishful thinking and hoping that some wonderful thing falls out of the sky um, and transforms us is, is probably in time that would work, maybe lifetimes, but, but it, it has more efficacy if we're actually engaged in the process, if we're awake to what we're actually doing. And you might find it more uh, motivating and inspiring to have some idea that we're actually transforming the mind, which is plastic, which is definitely transforming. And, and I think a lot of us feel as though we're trapped in our habitual way of looking at the world, <coughs> trapped in our habitual thoughts, or maybe trapped in our own mind. I think we all get kind of insulted by our brain sometimes, like, you know, the same things keep happening in the same ways, and we swear it off and we'll never do it again. And then we end up dating that same kind of person. So, you know, we tend to have these neural pathways that we kind of support in our brain, these sort of habitual patterns, if you will. And those patterns in time become deeper and deeper, more sort of thoroughly ingrained in us. And I think we feel like we don't have alternatives. The reason is, if we have a given pattern, that the receptors that create that pattern, the neural pathways, they actually become more uh, amenable to each other. They sort of wake up to each other more and they search each other out. So <coughs> if you're nervous, the neural pathway that says cigarette will, will pop in your mind if, if indeed you're a smoker. If you're not, it may be something else like chewing gum or calling an ex or something. <laughs> whatever, whatever we do to, you know, <laughs> to alleviate the stress, which I would think 80% 80, 80 of the time makes the stress worse, right? Mm -hmm. We're stressed out, so we drink coffee. Or we're lonely, so we call somebody that's already hurt us a number of times, <laughs> right? Or our mind isn't clear <coughs> enough, so we have alcohol. You know, whatever it is that we do, we tend to do the opposite, not really what we need, because we rely on old habits, things that we've learned, things that we've done before. The insult to the injury of this is that the more those neural pathways connect to each other, the less other pathways are available to us. In time, they actually begin to atrophy. So there's more space around that, that, that pathway, if you will, and less alternative. <clears throat> now the alternatives, of course, are there. It's just that it becomes harder and harder in time to find them. 
So Buddhism talks a lot about emptiness, if you've heard that, or egolessness. That's a very kind of profound philosophical point, and, and I don't think we have the time to get into it now, except to suffice it to say that we don't exist, or maybe we do. So, I think that sums it up. So the, um, or maybe we do, and we don't really. The fact is, is who we are, what we are, is an open question. And it's a much more plastic and mutable question than we understand, than we realize. What meditation begins to do for us is allow us to stabilize the mind so that we can relax into the operating system, so to speak, and begin to access alternatives more <coughs> readily. In, in order to do that, we might have to feel emptiness or egolessness. Who are you if you put down those cigarettes? Who are you if you're not <laughs> calling up, right, the boyfriend again? Who are we if we're not doing those same things over and over again? And we might feel as though we don't exist. Or if you ever done that, have you ever lost a job or lost a lover? or lost something that you've built an identity around, that moment is very profound. We don't like it. We think something's wrong and we kind of blame the other person. And blame is a wonderful way of not looking at situations and not really seeing what we can learn from situations. But if somebody leaves us and all of a sudden we wake up in the next morning and we're single, that's a horrific sort of experience, I think, for a lot of people, depending on how deeply our patterns were ingrained around this individual. But the real problem comes from the idea that we've created an identity around them, our ego structure, our idea of me, sort of wrapped around this other person, which is probably why they left. You know? <laughs> so, <clears throat> to some extent, who the hell are we when they're gone? Emptiness. The sense that we don't know who we are in certain moments in life. And what we tend to do is to ride over those moments, skirt over those moments, ignore those moments, put iPod on to drown out those moments so that we never have to feel how tenuous our sense of self really is, how fragile it is, how much it can change just by who we talk to or how somebody treats us. We can feel great about ourselves until somebody says, you're putting on weight, aren't you? And all of a sudden your day is gone. Right, or whatever it is. Or you do a little meditation and you feel like you've created this equanimity and bliss and get down to the subway and somebody doesn't have their metro card out and all of a sudden you're, you know, going postal. Our state of mind is really very fragile because it's very changeable and mutable. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good. I'm Joe. Michael. Michael, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, and Aldo referred me. Oh, really? Yeah, I was just working today. Wonderful. Ronaldo Phillips. Kevin Aldo. Ronaldo. Phillips. Yeah, I think so. Actually, just met him yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm new to New York, everybody. Just came in on Friday. Nice. I love this city. Thank you so much. I was living in Paris, and figured if I'm, if I'm forced to live in America, New York's the place. Could be the one place you could. It's a lateral move from yeah, Paris. Exactly. Anything else? Would it's like the twin sister. <laughs> it's like the twin sister. Yeah. Different parents, though. Godparents. <laughs> Thank you. We're talking about meditation, um, and the program is called Consciousness Clarity. What is it called? <laughs> consciousness. consciousness and clarity of mind. Yeah. So consciousness and clarity of mind. Hi. Hi. Sorry. That's okay. This is a talk about meditation. Yeah. <laughs> Explaining emptiness, you go. And uh, kind of, it's nice to see you. You can never be late for meditation. Right? That's good to know. Yeah. Just get up. All you have to do is sit down. Or sit up. <laughs> Just sit down and sit up. That's the complicated part. We were just talking a little bit about the, maybe a bit of the science of it. To me, the most profound part of it is how much we can actually change the patterns of our life, not by trying to do it, or saying, I don't want to do this anymore, because that only ingrains us further in those things. 
struggling with your weight, <laughs> uh, struggling with whatever it is you want to do, the more we struggle, the deeper we become enmeshed in whatever it is we're struggling against. Hatred binds, struggle binds, but love releases. So the most profound part of meditation is the idea that we actually become friends with ourselves, friends with these patterns that we feel locked into. Once we accept those patterns, become friendly with them, which is to say really actually acknowledge their existence and acknowledge that they're there for a reason. They may be an ineffective strategy to, <coughs> you know, sorry, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> clearly I haven't meditated enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it may be an ineffective strategy. We have lots of ineffective strategies to satisfy our needs. Meditation can allow us to actually come back down into our system enough to be able to look at what we're actually experiencing. Not so much chasing the carrot and the stick. Does that make sense? The carrot and the stick. The carrot and the stick. In Buddhism they call it samsara. That term is, is predates Buddhism, certainly in the Hindu tradition, a lot of Eastern. Here in the West, we, it, I think there's a perfume. But samsara is the idea that <laughs> we don't feel good enough. We don't feel like we have enough. We feel disconnected or disassociated or dissociated from ourselves. Really. And what we erroneously believe is that we need things to make us better, to make us whole, and make us complete. We need a religious structure. We need a spiritual system. We need the right drug. We need the right amount of caffeine. We need the right kind of bling. We need the right kind of friends. We need something to make us whole and complete. And I think a lot of us chase the dream with lovers and relationships finding that one person that's going to sort of satisfy everything and be everything. You've heard the poetry, right? And kind of, you are everything to me. You're the sun and the moon. That's like, I never want to hear that. You know? I feel like I, I want to be your sun and your moon. I want you to have your own sun and moon. So I can have my own sun and moon. And together we can enjoy each other. But when we feel needy, we don't feel like we have enough, we feel bereft, or we feel like we're not worthy of our own existence, then we start to cling and grasp on the stuff in our environment. The more we cling and grasp, the more those things become really important to us, the more me there is about everything. We're needy so that we need so much that there's all of me in everything. The more me there is, the less there is really everything else. So even though we're clinging to things, we're not really seeing the things we're clinging to. We're just seeing our need. And if there is some call and response with the universe, I think that if we're sitting there going, I really need a boyfriend, I really need a girlfriend, that the universe just hears the need part. And it goes, okay, have more need. You know, Dig yourself deeper into this feeling of disempowerment this connection. So to me the most profound part of meditation, and this very much speaks to the tradition I come from, is the idea that emptiness is just emptiness of our clinging, our grasping, our psychological and conceptual overlay to everything in reality. But that what's actually there is present, is kind of perfect, just as it is. A strange idea. You don't really have to be thinner, taller, richer. You might want to be, but it's not about you. It doesn't make you the wrong person or incomplete something. You could be alone and live alone. So Buddhism is very much a philosophy on independence, personal independence. So Satarpa, it's called personal liberation. This idea that we could actually be liberated from the addictive cycle of clinging and grasping, of needing. The addictive cycle of relying on each other to support ourselves. 
<coughs> Does that mean that we don't connect to each other? No, I think we're more able to connect to each other when we feel strong ourselves. Does that make sense? If we feel strong, then we actually attract what we want in life. Then we actually can give to other people. So it's just human nature. It's sort of sad. But you pass people in need all the time on the street. And it's hard. You almost have to stop to pay attention or to help. You know, because it's human nature to kind of avoid people who are in need and be attracted to people who can give. Does that make sense? So the more wealthy we feel inside, the more our life becomes awake and interactive with us. The more bereft we are, the more needy we are, the less we really receive from that. So then we, you know, overeat, hike, show up late for talks, any number of, oh wait, no, I'm not talking about you. Any number of things <laughs> happen to throw us away from our basic purpose. So maybe what we should do is a little bit of the meditation. Yes. <laughs> he's, emphatic. he's excited about meditation. Wow. Was that a statement of your excitement to do the meditation or your uh, tiredness of the talk? <laughs> Excitement. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. So the meditation really is about waking up. It's about taking our seat, if you will. And I believe yours is over here. My name's Joe. Andy. Hi. Hi, Andy. Hello. Welcome. So glad you can make it. Probably chair a lot of time. That's okay. We don't have to make Andy feel bad. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I was supposed to be here half an hour early and I was So everything goes from there. Let's sit up straight and try it. <clears throat> so the meditation really is about waking up and settling down. So there are two uh, almost contradictory but contrasting sort of elements to it. One is settling down and connecting to the earth, but another is waking up and paying attention. So we sometimes call it wakeful relaxation, right? Or relaxed wakefulness. We don't want to be so awake in our meditation that it becomes difficult and then we fail at it. And then it's more work, right? Than we need. Because we work hard. So why not have uh, a moment to relax? But if we're so relaxed that we don't really pay attention to what's going on, then we kind of lose the effectiveness of it. Does that make sense? So there's some sense of being able to empower ourselves in the present moment by actually being present in our own life and in our own experience. So <clears throat> sitting up straight is really important. There's an enormous amount of psychophysical energy that moves up and down the spinal, spinal column. The nervous system is really, really powerful system. A lot of energy, electrical, chemical, etc., which activates chemical, etc. A lot going on there. So if we can actually extend the spine up, what we do is we actually relax the system. And by creating space, our organs can relax and our internal body can relax. We can actually release the stress that comes from living in a world full of toxins and tension, expectation. So sitting up straight, as though there's a string pulling you up and back from the top of the back of your head. Sitting up straight so that we can relax, so then it's as though everything else kind of relaxes down around that. Does that make sense? So the feet flatten the floor. I'd recommend pulling away from the back of the chair a little bit so that you're under your own power and not sinking in. The spine rising straight up through the top of the back of the head. The eye gaze lowered or closed. The jaw relaxed the mouth slightly open. 
hands flat on the thigh. And I'd like to instruct us today in breath-based meditation. It's a really powerful form because the breath is reliably in the present moment. So it's bringing the mind back to the present moment. The breath also happens in the body. So it's bringing the mind back to the body. The body restores the tension, the toxins, the difficulties of our day. The body which needs to be healed by opening up. So breathing the breath into the body and bringing the mind down into that process of actually feeling the breath in the body. It's incredibly powerful. Two minutes a day of just sitting up straight actually changes brain chemistry. Not in a day, but just two minutes at any point. It's considered to be a good thing to do before a job interview or public speaking or anything where you might be stressed. To actually just sit up straight. And if meditation is difficult, then don't meditate. Just sit up straight. What it begins to do is tell the mind that you can do it, that you're capable of it. It makes us less reliant on clinging or grasping to other things. We actually begin to reformulate the brain and teach it. If mind pulls you away, or if you have thoughts or doubts, or you find your body caving in, which is of course the left effect of meditation, simply come back. Come back to the posture. Come back to the breath. So it's that easy. It's just a matter of breaking that momentum. And coming back to the breath. So meditation isn't really about creating uh, any kind of a trance state. It's about actually waking up and paying attention to who we are. And we can avoid that if we want to. We continue to watch the movies in our brain, or we could actually sit up and look right into the mirror. Sit up and actually see what it is we're feeling feel what it is for thinking. Okay, let's just stop for a moment. You want to stretch out a little bit? I recommend a little bit of actual stretching before meditation, for sure. <clears throat> if you wanted to do it on a regular basis, doing it in the morning is very good, but doing it daily, even five minutes a day, a little bit of stretching before is good. Ten minutes a day can make a huge difference. And if you schedule the half an hour of your day to actually do that ten minutes, then you could bring a little tea, like make a little area for yourself. My cats do this really well. Right? Look at cats and they have that sense they find the one place, right, where they're just, you know, at home. Right, they really connected heaven, earth, and man. And I think to some extent we've lost that in our culture because things are so fast. We've become disconnected. In the Taoist tradition they say that our root has been cut and so we're wandering ghosts. We're sort of spinning around, which is kind of why we're clinging and grasping it. Because we've lost this connection to ourselves and hence this connection to the earth. So the meditation, above all, sort of connects us back to that. And in so doing, it, 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 it goes to a deeper place than Buddhism. It goes to a very human place. It connects it to other traditions, the Navajo tradition, other traditions that are connected to the earth. It's not an ism at that point. It's really a human experience. And, uh, and a very settling experience. A settled mind 
is it has more clarity. It just does. The mind that's spinning and grasping and disconnected from its root really doesn't have clarity. It's got a lot of volume. It's got a lot of speed. It's got a lot of hall of mirror effect of thinking about thinking about thinking, criticizing our thinking, judging what we're thinking, and not really knowing what we're thinking because we're judging what we're thinking. Wondering why we don't know what we want, you know? Yeah? You meant volume or love, volume or space. When we're spinning around? When you said, yeah, a lot yeah. of volume. Yeah. 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 It's like a torrent, you know, sometimes. The mind. <clears throat> it just sort of spins. It is very powerful. So the idea of settling the mind then isn't the idea of punishing ourselves or putting ourselves in prison. This is about liberation. It's not about imprisonment. It's not about, oh, I should be quiet. Where it's very funny in meditation instruction, I give one-on-one -on -one instruction to people, and I'm a coach. I do it actually professionally with people. And we actually talk about it, and people constantly are like, well, I should have, or I didn't, or I'm sorry that I um, didn't, you know, and I'm like, I don't have a collar. You know, it's okay. That's a fine tradition. But that's not this tradition. This is just about making it easy for yourself to actually begin to wake up and not feeling guilty, not feeling bad about it, not putting more judgments on things, or expectations. Expect to become thinner, richer, more popular, or more enlightened, whatever the hell that is. Well, you know. But actually, just being able to spend some time connected to the earth and present present in our lives so that we have more stability. So stability leads to clarity. Does that make sense? It's as though the sediment sinks to the bottom and the water clarifies or purifies. So in the mind, a lot of our craziness just kind of settles when we settle and we begin to see more clearly, more completely. But sometimes in the, the Tibetan tradition, and I think this comes from the Indian, Northern Indian tradition, the Himalayan tradition, maybe, altogether, they use the image of a tiger because a tiger is actually very calm. It's a calm creature. It's not really jazzed up and nervous. If it does attack, it does so for food or self-protection. And it doesn't feel bad about itself. It doesn't sort of sit there going, I'm so fat. It's possible that humans are really the only animal that hates itself. Maybe the only form of life that hates itself. The only form of life that is disconnected from itself. Trees have the confidence to just grow. And if they're struck by lightning, then they grow in a strange way. But they're more interesting, really, aren't they? In some ways. But they don't sit there going, oh, I feel really bad about myself because I have a wonky branch. Kids won't climb on me. Nobody loves me. We're the only form of life that isn't happy with this. So to me, the most profound part of meditation is, yes, it releases stress. If you, if you could be with the breath and be in the posture, you could train yourself to actually release the stress in your day. You can come back to your body. You can come back to the breath. You can come back to your posture. That's huge. But more importantly, we can come back to our heart and begin to fall in love with ourselves. If you fall in love with yourself, then the world falls in love with you, and then you fall in love with the world. It doesn't make everything better. In fact, it maybe makes the stuff that's not so good more clear. But at least we're engaged in it, you know? It's like our life. The Shambhala Centers were founded by Chogyam Trumper Rinpoche, who's a Buddhist teacher. Um, and one of the things he said, one of my favorite quotes of the is, is Look at your life. How can you not look at it? It's your life. It's your very life. Look at it. So it's kind of interesting that we would decide to disempower ourselves and abdicate our life by getting lost in our thoughts and our ideas and then judging those ideas and separating ourselves so fully and completely from our experience. So the second part of the meditation that I'd like to do is kind of a meditation on compassion, if that's okay. Because the idea of compassion in the physical sense is to actually open the inner body 
So if the meditation mindfulness training is about sitting up straight and paying attention, attention to our attention, attention to our attention, or our attention to our discomfort, or our attention to our greedy need, you know, mindfulness, beginning to be more conscious in our life. Then the second stage of the meditation is to open up the heart and open up the internal body and begin to accept what we see. Because with just mindfulness, we can sit there going, oh, I'm always slouching, or I'm always distracted. But it's very important that we develop love along the way, that we then begin to go, oh, look at me, I'm always distracted. Or, look at me, I slouch. And begin to accept ourselves. Because it's only by accepting ourselves that we can allow ourselves to really grow. Because if you fight something in yourself, you'll get stuck there. I promise you, you'll be stuck there. I'm still working on my weight. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because it's a game. And that game stays. And I lose it and I put it back and I lose And it becomes this reference point. Does that make sense? But you have your own. We have our own patterns. Until we learn to accept them and love ourselves fully and completely, we never allow ourselves to grow. We get stuck in those patterns trying to fix ourselves. So the second part of the meditation is really coming in contact with what we call basic goodness, our fundamental sense of goodness and wholeness. Okay? So if we can go back to the meditation. <coughs> Sitting up straight. Where is the closest restaurant? Does anybody know? Straight down the hall to the right. Oh, yeah. the right. Left. Okay, by the other way. All right. So sitting up straight. The first part of the meditation then is mindfulness. And I like to look at it as a vertical orientation. We're connecting heaven and earth. So imagine your tailbone connecting down to the center of the earth and your spine aligning itself. In the Taoist tradition, they say the alignment of the spine leads, or should lead, or could lead to the center of the earth. The center of the earth is where all things are common. It's the surface of the earth where we're separated by nationality and culture, political beliefs, etc. But down at the core, we're human. We're connected to the planet, we're part of the planet, we're alive in a world that's alive connected to itself. So imagine yourself with the energy coming straight down through your body. Bring the energy down through your neck, through your heart, down through your stomach, down through your groin, connected down to From there, the energy rises up through the spine, up through the body, up through the top of your head, like a stalk rising from the earth, from the mind atop that blue, like the flower. Open it. The seed syllable, which is a syllable like a chord, if you will, in music. For space is ah. There's a sense of the mind going ah and opening up to space because it's connected to the earth, which is home. The vertical orientation of meditation is about waking up. Horizontal orientation is about opening up. So, if you will, place your hands over your heart. Closing the eyes, perhaps. See if you could fall into that a little bit. Not losing your posture, actually letting the posture be even more upright, but opening into the heart, opening into the hands. And instead of holding your heart, Imagine yourself being held. Being held so you're not frightened. And even if you think you're tough, 
your loins are girded against the city and you're all that. Inside there's parts of us that are frightened. And it's those frightened parts that force us to become things that are not helpful for us. Ways that we try to hide from the fear. By creating tension in the body, grasping in our stomach. Open up the body completely and fully. And as a method for this, imagine something in your heart that makes you happy. Bring something into your heart that makes you happy. Something simple, not like a lover. That's a very complicated thing. Something simple. An aspiration. And bring that into some sense of light and smile. Like light and smile in the heart. This isn't bull, you know. I think people think if they're angry and tense, that that's more real than if they feel love or openness. But in fact, we spend a lot of our day beating the heck out of ourselves and treating ourselves very badly. So we spend just two minutes here recharging the body by bringing love into the system opening up and bringing that smile through your own system. And if you find resistance to it, that's something good to look at. What is it about ourselves that keeps us from just accepting ourselves? Feeling love for ourselves. And then you can relax out. And if you will, just for a moment, for two minutes, maybe, let's sit with eyes open and the eyes just slightly lowered. The open gaze allows the senses to open altogether. It keeps us from isolating and just bring yourself into a more present situation. Exercise. Just one more minute. Release yourself from the meditation and just sit in whatever posture. And just as a little contrast, instead of trying to meditate, just relax and be present. What would it be like?
So, I'd like to do another exercise, if that's okay. Would that be okay? Yes. <laughs> the, the premise of the exercise is that, well, I'm using the example of a tiger again, the idea of the tiger is one of great contentment. Um, you can see that with the cats. They can get agitated, but they also could have this amazing sense of just relaxation, you know? Just like absolute obscene relaxation somehow. Or just a sense of really placement. And when I meditate, my cats come and they meditate with, which is really amazing. They feel it. They really feel it. And when I and my partner, if we're not getting along, which actually even happens after twenty years of meditation, I think it's just the way partners are. That's we're here to learn, you know. And sometimes we just disjoint from each other and we get like this, the cats feel it. Like they totally feel it. And there's a boy cat and he totally will protect his mom, right? If I'm mad at her, he'll just be like, you know? But when we're calm and we connect, they relax. And when we meditate, they relax too. And it's really interesting and it's kind of an indicator that the meditation actually begins to change the environment a little bit. It's sort of like as we connect to the earth, as we relax, the environment around us begins to relax. If you're upset at me and you insult me, what am I going to do? I'm going to then gird my loins and become this tense little robot figure of myself and try to defend myself, right? But if you disarm me and make me feel good about myself, then you'll see the best in me, you know? This is the idea that with contentment, with self-acceptance, we can begin to rest in this, what you call primordial confidence. The sense of confidence is not relational, it's not dependent upon the jewelry or the friends or the male in us. Confidence that just is the confidence of a flower that blooms, birds that fly, anything the rest of the world, the universe cries. So, the exercise here is a, a dyad, if that's okay. So it's turning to the person next to you and pairing off and, and the two of you just sitting together for a moment. Would you be willing to do that? Definitely. And so, what, what I'd recommend is if you find it uncomfortable, is you really look at that. It's kind of interesting. Like have a, have a sense of humor with that. So maybe go on and turn the chair right around. So this is awesome. Let, let me just you you guys continue what you're doing. I'm just gonna point out what I see. Somebody somebody wondering what they can do with their eyes, somebody else is texting, somebody else, which is cool, keep going. But it's really really it, no, but it is very interesting, isn't it? How it's it becomes an unsettling to actually just be kind of present. <coughs> just be just be with the other person. And just yeah. notice how it, and just notice how there's some uncomfortableness with that. And notice how to fill the uncomfortableness, to fill the space, we, we, we want to do something, or we want a reason for doing it. So here's the reason. The reason is because we want to be good. We want to what? We want to be good. We want to find our own goodness. We want to find our own contentedness and see how we kind of hide from them. We kind of hide from ourselves. We, or we shrink or we lower ourselves or we make jokes or, right? So just be present with each other. And then if you're facing the windows with all the plants, you be the first to offer to the other person something you see in them that you think will empower them. 
but not something that's not true. <laughs> but something that you actually see that you feel that will let them feel like they were seen and appreciated. And you can have two minutes, and then I'll stop, and then the other person will have a chance to do this. Okay. Nice eyes. No, thank you. Nice color. Nice <laughs> color. <laughs> Blue. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm like mine. No, 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 no. Ha hecho este ejercicio otra vez. Okay, when you're ready, please reverse and the other person. Then I can where he started. Okay. So then, no, you don't have to change seats. Just tell the other person something that you can see. At least. They're gentle. Mm -hmm.
It's integrated body and mind, left and right brain. Masculine and feminine components of the psychology integrated sort of into one thing. So breathing into the heart or breathing into the body actually settles us, brings us back into ourselves. If that makes sense. From that point of view, there is more clarity, you know, less because we're less worried about what everybody thinks and more in touch with what we, what we really feel. How would your life be different if you, if you fully accepted yourself? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't be so angry. I would um, be more patient. And everything would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there would still be everybody else. <laughs> but with me, it'd be okay. Yeah. But well, we'd have more patience. Do you ever find that you get angry at other people because you're angry at yourself? Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's really interesting. And then it becomes even harder when the other people get mad at you for being mad at them. Because you're like, I was mad at me in the first place. I want somebody to love me. I don't know about you, but I've found that that experiment doesn't work. Being mean to people so that they'll love you. It's just not an effective thing. You know? ever called, how many people have you called an asshole and they turn around and go, oh, thank you. I really needed to hear that today. <laughs> I really, thank you. You're right. I didn't know. That's very helpful. Thank you. But, but Joe, I think in addition to that, waiting around for people to love you also. Or go to the other extreme and trying to make them love you by being all loving. Well, you know, right? Yeah. Or like leaving this talk because we talked about all this and going, I love everyone. No. <laughs> That'll last until you get in the subway. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Something like that, right? It's like got to be a fundamental change, I think, that we learn to accept ourselves. And that's why the meditation training is a daily, I think it's a daily endeavor. Even if it's just 10 minutes a day, because it's retraining the mind to begin to accept itself, instead of constantly looking for, for demons and angels to save it or to fight, you know. Yeah. Did anybody else have any great things to share? Or not so great things? Well, it's the struggle of being and not being and, and, uh, and trying to, to look at loving or, or the, the, that maybe we need someone to love us or that you need love as if, as if it's an external thing or random or, or, or precise thing, you know, that some person, that one person, that, that love, that caring when... Um, it's it's in every single one of us. It's, it's it is what, what we are. If we didn't have love, we wouldn't get up from bed because something has to motivate you. And and, and what does things? What motivates things is love. It's it's a love. If you're good at your job, it's because you love your job. Um, if you're good as a parent, it's because you love parenting. Not love your kids, but love parenting. Love that process. It's so. Uh, I must love it's already my there. Cap, then, the you you, know, you love chest. listening to, <laughs> to <laughs> Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, some wouldn't understand that, but there, there it is. It's, it's there. So. Well, my, my teacher, Sakyang Mipong, uh, the son of the founder of Shambhala, he's a wonderful teacher. But he says that love just is. It's already there. That we don't have to do anything. This is where it plays into the acupuncture idea. That the health isn't something we need to get. It's just, we need to just get rid of the things that are blocking the health. Does that make sense? Like, get rid of the blockages. Same with mental health. We don't really need to be different. We don't need more of this or more of that. We just need to balance out the system so that it can operate effectively and efficiently. You know? And so if we believe that love is already there, we don't have to make it happen. We can just stop the things that are blocking it stop the ways that we rely on hate instead of harmony, if you will. 
Yeah. Question. Earlier you said that everything's already perfect or something along those lines. And that strikes me as a little confusing because the way that makes me feel is, well, if I'm not experiencing perfection, then I must be doing something wrong or I'm seeing the world incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by perfection? What, what I mean is it doesn't have to be fixed, except uh, from the point of view of your idea of fixing it. Your idea of fixing it probably is something I agree with, I just feel like that, but maybe other people wouldn't. Do you know what I mean? And, right, and some people's idea of fixing things, I definitely don't agree with, you know? I'm not so sure if Congress has got the right way to <laughs> to, 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 to work with things. <laughs> They're still getting paid, by the way. Which, yeah, is, which is ridiculous. It's really amazing. That's amazing. Okay, okay, so I don't want to start that, right? But somebody know. thinks they're doing the right thing in all of that, right? So all these ideas that we trumpet our, our way of looking at the world and it should be our way, you know? The perfection really is accepting what's there, what's actually happening. Then things can change. It's, it's like love is already there. Change is already happening. So there's people who go, well, how do I accept the fact that I'm angry all the time? Well, accept it so that it can change. Does that make sense? Because change is the natural state. When you fight something, you freeze it. If you fight something that stays frozen, the people you're fighting will always hate you. As soon as you learn to communicate, then things begin to change. You begin to see that they're different than what you thought. Does that, does that make sense? So by accepting the world and accepting ourselves, we're not saying that everything is perfect in that it's all it, it's, it's all good the way we want it to be. <laughs> but it's like, it's what it is. Yeah. And we could either separate ourselves out from it, or we could join the party. Well, we're also looking at it from the deluded mind, I mean, or wrong view, whichever you want to call it. And that's until we get to that state, it won't be perfect in our eyes. I think that that state... This is, I'm going to say something a little... Uh-oh. Yeah? Can you see the Buddha going like this. <laughs> well, I think that the enlightened state is much closer than we realize. And, the, and it's, it's a bit of a... I'm, I'm not saying you're saying this. You're not saying this. but exaggerating the idea that it's somewhere out there or somewhere far away or it'll take me lifetimes to get to it. Sort of gets us off the hook. But it's possible that we, our minds move through complete clarity all the time, but we don't recognize it. Because what we recognize is me. And me comes when we're inflamed. And that's when we're the most occluded. So the more me, the less there is clarity. Does that make sense? But those are the things we think are us. So moments of real clarity, I, I think, go by kind of unnoticed because there's no me there to see them. Does that make sense? And I think the mind is probably 80% that. You know, our experience may be 80% that. We, we kind of remember or retain a very small amount of what we actually see, hear, feel, yeah. taste, and touch. So we tend to organize around this me, and me organizes around whatever problem we're dealing with. You know, so my God, I'm tired today. So all my experience today is about how tired I am, or supporting how tired I am, or how I have to eat better, or should drink less caffeine, whatever. Right? Instead of all the other things that I've seen, felt, tasted, touched, and, and didn't even notice because I was so caught up in the me. Yeah. It's, um, I, I find that it's also um, those moments of clarity many times are very subtle. And, and it could be a smile from, from a complete stranger, something unconditioned, something that just happens. And it is a moment, it's a connection, it's a, it's a very brief moment of that you know, those bodhicitta yes. and, and um, but it's very subtle so you don't go home and say oh, stranger smiled at me you know and, and, and that'd be wrong do you fix it but, but it's, it it's just going by and then it's, you, know? you know we pick up with it made a the light changing the guy that just banged into me and all the other you know physical uh, mundane things that we do for I'm uh, thinking about the question of, you know, are things okay, really? And what I feel like 
more and more as I hate myself less and less is um, that uh, you know actions and words can be part of the sort of ongoing things being okay that there's um, that you can act and speak wholeheartedly and and find that um, it's effective in a way that the kind of ambivalent querulous speech that I remember making before is not you know that would often make matters worse at home for example and um, it's you know more the point of unselfconscious action in other words um, but you have to watch out you know you I mean the kind of there's always like the, the pressure of kind of secondary attitudes kind of trying to come in. I, I don't know, I haven't um, quite got it. Um, but I would say that um, part of that yeah, kind of acceptance definitely includes one's own speech and actions. I think so. So we, we call it in, in the business mindfulness, which is a sense of paying attention, right? And there's categories of it. mindfulness of body. We actually begin to see how we create aggression in our own body, anger, separation. And aggression could be defined as anything that separates you from reality or other people or yourself. Like anytime you pull apart and go into here, into an idea or concept, you know? That's why the Bodhicitta practice is so important. The Tibetan Buddhist Lama Dilgo Kensa Rinpoche, the teacher of my teachers and the teacher of the Dalai Lama, one of the wise people during his time, um, he uh, he said that you know our mind is like water, our thoughts are like water. They can either be fluid and connective, or they can be frozen and disconnected. And that the heat of compassion melts frozen part of the mind and allows it to become reconnected again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's really a sense of actually opening that up. So th that's our, our time for today. I wanted to just lead us, is that right? 7.15. Yeah, so we're late already, so that's, that's, that's just about right. So, um, but it, can we stay three more minutes? And that I just want to lead us in a very quick meditation to kind of sum it up. But let's not call this a meditation. Let's just call this a, uh, an exercise. So the, in a quick summation, if we become what you said, aware of yourself, or mindful of ourselves, then we can become mindful of our body, like I said. We can become mindful of our emotions. We start to really learn how needy we are a lot of the time. And that's not a bad thing. It's like we're little kids. There's a child inside, a forgotten child, if you will. And, you know, something that we just pull down our own needs because we don't think we're worth it. We can't just say, oh my God, I need a friend right now, you know, or I need support right now. We just drink coffee and blow you through and get the, get the work done, you know. And sometimes we're not aware of our mind. Our mind just goes off and starts spinning into really aggressive thoughts. And or disconnected thoughts or distraction. So I want to just take three minutes and put it all together, okay? So a minute for the body. The best place for the body for right now is sitting up straight so that it can settle. Breathe out with me. The tailbone connected down to the center of the earth where all things are common, back to our common heritage human. And then rising straight up through the back of the head like the stalk of a plant to the sun, the mind to top that opening. Brilliant, awake, clear. Shoulders open, hands flat on the thighs, jaw released. A sense of being awake. A posture that says, I'm here, I'm in my life. The second part of the posture is opening the inside of the body, putting the hands over the heart, say ah. Just 
system. Take an image of the dog or the cat, something you love, the Buddha, something that's awake and shining a lot. Miley Cyrus, whatever. Sorry. Whatever you think, sorry. Whatever you think makes you smile and makes you laugh and all that. Okay? And just let that, if you can imagine, and for a minute now, just allow yourself, imagine, as though that smile, that sunlight, that love just shines through your whole body. Don't think it. Try to feel it. This is the essence of what we call the yogic practices body practices, or somatic, actually changing the body chemistry. So imagine the sunlight coursing through your circulatory, nervous, respiratory system, opening up the whole system with this sense of light, love, and kindness, acceptance. And from this point of view, accepting how you feel. Even if you're lonely, if you're sad, if you're tired, then you're still your best friend. Your only friend, really, sometimes. And it's time that we got on our own page with ourselves and you know, reconnect. And then finally bringing in the mind. So dropping the hands, opening the eyes. And just for one minute, let's just be present. And you don't need to meditate. Worry and be anything other than what you are in this moment. Last exercise then begins now and extends for the rest of your life. <laughs> and uh, it's an encouragement to just, you know, do what you can to wake up and be part of it. So thank you very much. Thank you.